Okay, afternoon everyone. We'll, we'll make a start. Um, first of all, thanks for thanks for joining us today. So something a little bit different and really exciting for, for you that are joining us. Um, so really pleased that we're joined by uh, Rebecca from the Premier League. So Rebecca, just give us a little little wave or hello. There she is. Um, and also really, really delighted to, to welcome our special guest today, uh, Anthony Taylor. So a current Premier League match official. So hopefully... Um, you'll get a lot out of it. I know some of you are from a lot of different programs that we run in community. Um, we're from our kicks program, girls, uh, we've got some power chairs, some disability players and so on. So really good to get a mix of uh, people on here. Um, and as we go through the, the presentation, Anthony's going to give you a bit of a, an insight into his journey, into how he got to, to where he is now. Um, and then. I know some of you have sent some questions in, so we might unmute you and you can ask them. And also Steve and Luke will just have a little look at the, the chat box. So as Anthony's going through, if there's anything that you might want to ask or clarification or anything, put it in there and Steve and Luke can, can manage that if that's okay. Is that all right, Anthony, over to you? Yeah. Great stuff, man. <laughs> the share my screen. Okay. Does that come up okay? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, then. Uh, great to see you all. Hope you're all keeping well. And um, as Andrew said, feel free as we go, go, go through this uh, presentation to, to chip in with the questions and uh, we'll, uh, we'll answer them as we go along. But um, really, the, the aim of the aim of today is I want to show all of you that being a professional ref is an option, an alternative route in the game compared to, to playing or coaching or anything of such like. And, and let's remember, we're not just talking about um, officiating in men's professional football. There's a wide diverse uh, range now of, of games so specific questions on twenty five years ago when when I first started. And, and just like a, just like a player, it takes hard work and commitment to to reach the very very top. Um, and how you bounce back from disappointment is is usually the way that we learn, we get better, and and we we strive to get better. And obviously, the ultimate rewards for a top elite footballer or an elite referee is to being involved in all the, the high profile matches both here and abroad, international tournaments. And uh, and of course, like most of us, most of you I presume, when I was at school, when I had hair, uh, I didn't have the courage to have put the picture on with me with my curtains on. Um, but uh, I'm sure Steve uh, Steve was probably about the same a few years before that as well. But you know, my ambition when I was a uh, at school when I was still playing football was was to play in an FA Cup final like most people who play football these days and you're probably wondering what this picture is on the screen but everyone has a dream of playing so this is my hometown team the uh, Altrincham who I support not particularly a successful team in terms of a professional game but one of the most successful teams at giant killing teams in the history of the FA Cup and this is the team in 1995 that had just missed out on promotion to the Football League when I was starting to go and watch games. And it's really down to going watching these games that I actually got involved in refereeing. I didn't want to be a ref when I was at school. I was an average player. Uh, I, was a, I was a really good defender, actually, because I never played the ball and I never made sure anybody got past me. But... Every weekend, I would spend time going to watch 
Altrincham play home and away in the what was then the Vauxhall Conference. And it came to a point where the mother was sick and tired of me coming home every weekend, complaining about the referees costing us the game and costing us the point. And that was the reason why um, we weren't being promoted and we weren't winning games. And so really, my mum set me a challenge. She either told me to go and try the, the refs course or shut up, basically. <laughs> And and that was back in 1995. Now, the majority of the games that I first started doing were in both the Altrium Sunder League and the Winningshire Sunder League. And these were basically pub teams. Pub teams full of 18-plus-year-old. Um, usually also... Some of the better teams had players playing from the semi-professional game. This was before player contracts came into being in the semi-professional level. So, as you see there, at that picture of Withenshaw Park, that could host 25 matches on a Sunday morning. It's 25 pitches side by side. And some of the better games, they had two, 300 people stood around those pitches watching. So, you can imagine how many people were actually there at half past ten on a Sunday morning. It was absolute carnage sometimes. You couldn't tell where one pitch started and one pitch finished. Um, but these are these were happy memories for me, and these are the these are the games that actually helped me develop my skill set from a very very early age. Because just like when you go and get a job for the first time, a young person can be quite intimidating and nervous about interacting with older people. And so we should never underestimate the importance of how we communicate with people um, and how we can learn to deal with different situations, whether that be having positive conversations with people or, or dealing with conflicts as you would do in, particularly in a Sunday, Sunday morning game. And so 1995 was a real... It was an eye-opener for me, first of all. But it really toughened me up from the very, very start. And it's only after these initial um, initial games that I really started getting the bug for um, being involved. I, I was realistic. Like I said, I was no fantastic player. I was a Sunday League player, tops. And so, actually, having the, having the chance of potentially refereeing was a great way of staying involved in football but maybe also reaching the higher levels and 1995 was actually only a couple of years after the actual Premier League was formed as well so at that time being a professional referee wasn't even um, an option because that only came for a few few years later further down the line when more when more money was invested in in the officials um, but, you know, the initial impression of people who officiate games is, well, I probably haven't got any friends and I certainly don't have any hair and, you know, and not many people, not many people like refs, but nothing could be really further from the truth because believe it or not, if you're actually going about your job, showing that you're putting the effort in showing you're working hard and showing that you're just trying to help and make the game more enjoyable for everybody. Even players at grassroots level really, really appreciate that. And so even if you go away from this talk today and you, and you still don't think that you would fancy being, trying being a ref, actually go away and start thinking about how you actually deal with people and what, what kind of perception people have of you. Um, and that never underestimate that because that's so so important in everything that we do in life, people's perception. So always think about ways of of creating positive, how you can create a positive perception about yourself when other people are looking at how you're going about things. So then, from the um, just give you an idea, it can take a good number of years to progress through the system. So from from starting on the on the Sunday leagues all the way through to the Premier League, 
it uh, it took me best part of 15 seasons and that's not an unusual occurrence that's about the average time it can take to to, to go all the way through because we have so many different steps to go through um, so a few a few memorable places for me so the bottom left is rossendale united which um is the is where I refereed my first Northern Premier League game in 2001. Um, top left is, is Southport, where I refereed my first National Conference game. And top right is Wrexham, which is where I refereed my first Football League game. And, and bottom right is where I refereed my first Premier League game, Fulham Portsmouth, in, in 2010. And I always like to look at this because it's it's... It's nice to remember your, your roots and remember the progress that you took because um, anything that we do in life, any success, you're only judged on on your last game, particularly particularly in football. Same can be said for players, managers, coaches, and, and equally for referees. You only you're only as good as your last game. Nobody remembers the great game you played or refereed five years ago. Um, or even three weeks ago, everybody just remembers that last perceived poor decision that you made. Um, and actually, when you actually have reached the top level and you look back at some of the places that you did go to as part of your, the early stage of your career, um, it makes it all worthwhile. And you know, only a couple of week, weeks after playing, uh, refereeing that match at Rossendale, which is obviously not a very warm place to be, even in the middle of summer, as you can tell by the hills. Um, my third or fourth match was at Accrington Stanley, who are obviously now a football league team. The ground is barely different to what it was in 2001. And, and John Coleman was still the manager <laughs> all, all the way back then. And so, you know, that's a, that's a contrasting positive story about somebody working hard and, and focusing on achievement where a, a particular individual has been a manager at a, a club for a number of years and progressed all the way through from Northern Premier League all the way through to, to the professional game. Well, that is generally the, the route you take. And, and obviously, different parts of the, the country, the middle bit differs slightly because the pyramid, football pyramid is slightly different now. So... The Northern Premier League would be equivalent to what the old Southern Isthmian League is down your neck of the woods. Um, but again, leagues have been rejigged all the time. But at every single level, this gives us an opportunity to, to learn new skills. So like I said, usually the same always applies to players as well, as if you're working your way through, through different levels of the, of the game. Styles of play are different. The quality of the pitches are different for sure. The quality of the facilities are different. The size of the crowds steadily increases, you well know. Um, and obviously, the, the, the biggest the biggest challenge as you, as you move to the higher levels is the level of scrutiny from the media. And it was only just, really just, in just, yes, Mike. Just on that before you before you go on. So there was a question oh. from. There's a question from Ryan, what you sent in, that, that probably links to that. was just, what kept you, well, it's two parts, really. What kept you motivated to continue refereeing, like you say, under some of the scrutiny that you got probably coming through your, your journey? And then also just in terms of the steps that you had to take in terms of your training in between all the different levels? Okay. Um, so in terms of the scrutiny, um, in this country, we have a system where, um, where clubs get the opportunity to feed back on referees' performances for every game, which is obviously a really, really important, um, really, really important time um, for people to reflect and, and learn from. But that feedback's not feedback is not always objective. So, for example, if a if a penalty is given in the last minute, and even if it's a correct penalty, that kind of feedback would would not always be positive. So, you kind of learn. As you're coming through, you're almost well. I think the best way of approaching it is you're trying to help educate people about why you are doing things, but also about about the laws of the game. One of the biggest frustrations for for us when we go to any match at any level 
is a lot of arguments that people have about a decision being right or wrong is always flawed because it's never using the up-to-date version of the laws of the game. And I'm not saying we need to be sat there like real saddles and be quoting the, the rules of football like in black and white. But, you know, I think a, re- a recent example, I, a few months ago, I was at um, a National League North game doing some coaching with a younger ref and a club official was having a d- discussion with me using the offside law from 15 years ago. And he still thought that was in in current practice. So that's that is some of the real challenges coming through with the scrutiny. People will be very willing to criticise you without really understanding what they're saying, which can be very frustrating. So, But that's an opportunity for us to um, try and educate. In terms of training, obviously, I'll touch on training very shortly, but the the biggest challenge when you are coming through the system, very much again like players would experience, certainly at Northern Premier League, everybody, you, you have a full-time job. And even even when I was a football league referee, so up to 2009 before I got into the Premier League, I had a full time job. So I was I was on shift work as a prison officer. So um, you know, some some days I would be starting a shift at six o'clock in the morning, finishing at one, driving to London to referee a match in the evening, driving straight home, and then back on shift again at six o'clock. And that's a continual cycle. And that is what a lot of match officials still do. A lot of football league referees still do that. A lot of female officials still have to do that. You know, so there's some some real challenges. The easiest comparison to make is is like Olympic athletes. Olympic athletes have to have to work to raise their own funds to to train to get to the Olympic Games. So it's very much along those lines. Okay. So again, once once you reach different different levels, you never really become aware of some of the opportunities that are available to you until you actually reach that level. So when I first became a, a football league referee in 2006, I never really thought, oh, I could be a Premier League referee in a couple of years. And when I became a Premier League referee in 2010, I didn't really think, oh, I could be a FIFA referee in a couple of years. But I was lucky enough to get onto the international panel in 2013. And that in itself presents lots and lots of different opportunities, but equally challenges. So, um, first and foremost, you want to do the very best games being being the main referee on the field. But in recent years, we've also had the opportunity um, to be involved in some of the best games with acting as the additional refs behind the goal. Um, and obviously some lads are, are now branching out into VAR side of it as well in, in tournaments. But my first game abroad, as you see on the bottom left of the screen, that was in um, it was a Champions League qualifying in Bratislava. And I couldn't find a picture of the actual game, but when when this game was taking place, that, that stadium was full and you couldn't really see from one side of the pitch to the other because there was that much smoke from fireworks, um, which is something we don't experience in this country. Um, so different cultures, you, you haven't alone with different cultures, different ways of different interpretations of, of the, the rules um, and different styles of play. Yeah. So... Lots and lots of different things to, to learn and consider. Um, obviously, the other three um, pictures across the top are, like, like I say, some of the situations I've been fortunate enough to be involved in a few years ago were Europa League, Champions League and Euro, Euro finals four or five years ago. Um, and then obviously, at the moment, myself and my, my current team, we're working towards, or well, we'd hope to have, been in, involved in the Euros which started last week, um, but that decision was obviously delayed because of coronavirus. So again, that's all in the mix now. So my team, um, we're working towards trying to be selected for the next two tournaments, which is Euros and, and the World Cup. But the international opportunities added a huge, hugely 
um, enjoyable dimension to officiating. So again, for, for anyone who thinks that, you know, elite refereeing has never really been um, an entertaining or viable option, you know, this these kind of opportunities are, are not to be sniffed at if you're if you're prepared to work hard and 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 aim towards uh, the top end of uh, of what you can achieve. Anything? Any questions before we just give you a flavour of what it's what it's like in, involved to what it's like at the top level? I think just just one from from my perspective, Anthony. Just how do you get along with language barriers when you do international work? Okay, um, so why is Rebecca smiling? Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're really lucky that English is generally the the main language of within international football. So most people you will come across um, will speak English. I can speak some very very small amount of French, German, and Spanish words, but literally words to. Make, get my point, but a lot of um, a lot of focus and preparation goes into not just not about the words, but about body language and the importance. It goes back to what I was saying before about how we communicate with people, the importance of eye contact um, and and your gestures and your demeanour have can convey messages to players abroad far more effectively than trying to, trying to speak. A couple of words of their own language. Yeah. Okay, so just um, that was my a very short version of, of my rise to the top, and I just wanted to spend a, f a couple of minutes of just giving you a couple of key areas of give you a flavour of w what it's actually like to officiate at the top level, and to give you a flavour. So, in terms of the scrutiny we are under these days is most people are interested and obsessed with the level of accuracy, particularly in terms of uh, major decisions around penalty errors and sendings off and things like this. So we have this uh, system which absolutely analyzes every single decision you make during the course of a game. So that doesn't just mean when you blow your whistle, it means every time you have to make a judgment. Um, so it's a very in-depth analysis. So as you can see, I put a, a snapshot of, of the system from a, a game earlier in the season. And, and what you can see, if you look at the screen, I actually failed to detect that Man United should have been given a penalty in the derby earlier this season. So you can see where it's, it's graded as uh, incorrect in red. Yeah. Um, and I have to provide my own analysis of why I think the decision may be wrong. Um, and then it shows the process of VAR being involved and the, getting the correct decision and the player being cautioned for the challenge which resulted in the, in the penalty. But this is done for every single decision in the game. So for throw-ins, any potential physical contact um, where judgments have to be made. So on average, <clears throat> in a Premier League game, we, we referees make 245 um decisions on average that's that equates to making a judgment roughly every 22 seconds um, and of those judgments we split them down to around 200 of physical offenses potential physical offenses um, and about 165 times out of that 200 you'll just allow play to continue i.e you'll decide there's nothing nothing happened so everything's graded and they like to produce an overall total accuracy for, for the decision making in the course of a game. Now we also have another system as some of the guys from the club might know. We also have a delegate system where we have ex-players and ex-managers who, who watch the game from a, a player's perspective as well. And they also provide a separate report and a separate analysis of performance. So we have a technical analysis like the one I've just shown you. And then we have a more holistic analysis from the game's perspective to almost 
analysing the perception it will create, how we how we manage the game, how we deal with players, and how how the uh, the person watching actually thinks we've uh, judged particular situations. So that obviously then also leads to decision making under pressure. So it's very difficult to describe to people what what this is actually like. <laughs> Um, it's very also it's also very difficult to recreate in a training setting. So whereas a pilot might have a simulator, um, while I'm doing training in the week, I can't physically recreate being stood in front of eighty thousand people and trying to decide whether someone's dived or not, or has committed a handball offence or not, or has deserves to be sent off. Um, and so a lot of other work goes into working on your your judgment and your ability to analyze situations in a split second so we use quite a lot of simulated um stuff through a, digitally clips different angles things like this um and obviously it's impossible to get everything right 100 percent of the time physically impossible but what we try and work hard to do is to try and limit the times that we get things wrong, particularly in the in the important areas. Um, you know, and and there's a lot of things that come together. So the picture that I've put on this slide here is um, probably the decision I'm most proud of in terms of getting getting correct in in a high pressure situation. So this was the FA Cup final, which I'll just talk about shortly. But Victor Moses, who'd already been cautioned, he dived to try and win a penalty. So I had to decide whether one, whether he dived, and two, whether he should be sent off. Um, which thankfully, the, the judgment was correct. But a lot of the things that underpin the decision were in terms of the, the basics that, that we work on on a daily basis in training. So um, your movement around the field, reading the game, reading how that situation develops into the penalty area. So you, you can actually move into... A position to make the correct judgment because if you're not in the correct position you you're either blocked by a player or you don't quite get the angle and this is where for people who currently play um this is where you could benefit if you chose to go down a refereeing route at a later date because you have a good understanding of the game and that that understanding will help you read certain situations a little bit better than and, not, and there's not many examples of ex-players taking up the whistle. We, we used to have a football league referee called Steve Baines in the early 2000s, late 90s. But, you know, there's not many other examples. But actually becoming involved in, in refereeing and, and learning a little bit more of the intricacies of the law, one helps your understanding of the game more as a player, but equally, player going into refereeing will help your reading of the game will help with decision making sometimes as well. And the last area um, to, to give you an idea of is, is about fitness. So we touched on it before. So just a few stats in the in the over the last five years, the speed of a Premier League match has increased by I think it's actually over 20%, but 20% is a is a ballpark figure. So if you can actually Imagine how that equates or impacts on not only on match day, but how you have to prepare for that. So, a couple of stats there from my own personal stats from last season, eighteen nineteen. Um, so, my average total di distance was nearly two kilometres more than the average player in a game. And. Um, and the top speed for sprinting during a game is, is is similar to a player, just a touch less than than a than a top player as well. And the two examples there that I've put there, my heart rate traces, they're two sessions I've been doing in the last couple of weeks to prepare for tomorrow night's restart. So these are these are sessions that we do to try and replicate match scenario, so match situations. So it's, the sessions are about an hour long. But the crucial thing here is, as you can see, the heart rate data. So zone four is your high intensity zone. So that's probably about twice or three times the, the amount of high intensity running that some matches would put you under. So 
we always try and aim to, to train at a greater intensity so when we come to the match the physical intensity doesn't challenge us and then all your focus and your energies can actually go into reading the game and moving into position and making the correct decisions. So I started by saying that everybody who plays football always dreams of officiating the FA Cup final. So 2017, I was, I was very fortunate enough to, to do that. And in a refereeing sense, you only get to referee this match once in your whole career. So where players might get to play in it two, three, four, five times, we only get to appear once in this in this match. So, <clears throat> you know, I started by saying that I wanted to try and show you of this being a different option that is open to you um, as opposed to playing or coaching. Okay. And as I said before, as a player, if you work hard and you train hard, then you um, you get to play in the best games. You win you win medals, you win trophies, um, you win records as, as players scoring goals. From an officiating perspective, you could apply the same mentality and the same work ethic, and you can still achieve lots within the game and still be involved in the game to a to a really high level. At the end of the day, it's the it's it's the best seat in the house, apart from playing. So that's that's my brief snapshot. I hope it's not too brief for you. But if it, if you've got any questions, please don't um, don't hesitate to ask. I'm just going to come off off sharing my screen. Andrew, you'll have to tell me if people are wanting to ask or anything. Yeah. I yeah, can so come in there, Andy, if you like. Yeah, yeah. Andrew, really fascinating. That was. Thanks for that. It's really, really good to see the journey. One thing that I think would be really good for everybody on the call to understand is that that stage where you came from um, having two jobs, in effect, uh, being a prison officer and, and, and officiating and then going to full time. Um, what does what does a full time week look like for you as a referee? Is it is there fitness every day? Is there a bit of practice in terms of making decisions every day or what does the week look like? It's, um, it's difficult. To, uh, it's difficult to give you a a standard week because it'll vary so much in terms of um, have I got commitments for UEFA or FIFA um, but if, if we forget that for a minute if, it, if it's just a normal week between a weekend and a weekend with Premier League matches it will mainly it will mainly be four of the five days tra fitness training wise um, you'll spend time reviewing your match from you know you have to you need to go through the whole game on that the analysis system um and um and reviewing stuff with with the rest of the team and then equally we also have training camps as well so um every fortnight we use st george's park as as our training base usually um and so a bog standard week would be very much orientated on on training and and just an, an analysing the game. If, it, if you throw into the international game with it, so most Champions League and Europa League games take three or four days out of the week. Um, so you're normally there a day, <clears throat> depending on where you are, you're normally there a day or two before the match. And you fly back the, the day after. So if you if you were lucky enough to go to Russia a couple of times, <clears throat> excuse me, then it could take out the most of your week just travel-wise. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Thanks for that. Um, you also mentioned the, uh, the team that you work with and um, um, how, does, how does that work as well? Do you spend some time uh, as a team going through the game together? I know you say you meet up as well, but do you, do you get that period of reflection time together and how you might change or adapt anything? Yeah, so in an ideal scenario, in an ideal scenario you'd work with the same two assistants all the time. Now that's... Um, that's not always possible. So, usually, the two the two most fortunate refs are myself and Michael Oliver, um, and we tend to get to work with the same two assistants all the time because they're the lads who work abroad with us as well. Um, and so, when you're working together as a a settled team, it's much much easier to um, analyse analyse your game um, between the three of you. But obviously, we, we'll use different methods, just like you guys would do with players. 
Um, so if, if, if one of our coaches is at the match, we'd then have a conference call, you know, later in the week to analyse particular situations and stuff. Um, and we're really, believe it or not, we're probably the most really critical of what what you can do because you can get to you can get to listen back to the audio as well because with VAR everything's recorded. You see, so it's a really good training tool to actually listen back to why you made a decision. And if you're making the wrong decision, I, I remember I I gave a I missed a penalty. At, Chelsea, uh, Tottenham, Chelsea before Christmas, and I gave a foul on the goalkeeper, and how I, I, I'm still at a loss how I did. Um, but then once I got sat down and listened to the audio from the game, then I understood why I made the mistake because you can actually hear how you, what you're talking about as it's as it's going on. You know, so I'm out of position. I've got the wrong angle. I misjudged it all. But all that's really useful to learn from the mistake and not try not to do it again. <clears throat> Excellent, thank you. And um, we've got a, a lot of uh, young people on the on the Zoom call with us this afternoon. Yeah. I'm just interested about the support. Obviously, um, the, the the support you get now and and the time you get to allow to that to happen to for you to perform at your best uh, come match day is 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 really there. What was it like as an early referee? Did you have a mentor? Did the county FA play a role in that in supporting yeah. you as a, as a younger referee coming into the game yeah. for the first time? I think sometimes that the most important thing to remember as young people is that you should, and I know it's easier said than done, and I'll sound like a, a parent here because my girls always tell me off for saying this, but you should always try and be the very best that you can be at whatever you do. And I know that's a pain in the backside sometimes for you to do that. Um, but, you know, particularly in my younger days, we, had, we we did have some form of mentoring, and, but there's a lot more support available now than there ever has been. Um, and so if someone's encouraging you to, to try and develop and, and be the best you can, make the, make the most of the help that's on offer, make the most of the support, the, the support that's on offer. Because, um, you know, sometimes things will, things will be difficult and you will need help with things. Um, but it's, it's it's so so important to try and take advantage of the help that's there. But always always try and do the best, or always try and be the very best that you can be. Absolutely, great advice. We've got um, a few questions coming in, some really good ones. We'll get on to the uh, VAR questions and some oh, of them really? in a minute. But uh, yeah. <laughs> um, it says uh, Morgan's put uh, your referee in the, the City Arsenal game um, tomorrow. Uh, we're all looking forward to football coming back. What's your What's your routine between now and uh, the game starting? What What path will you take? Okay, uh, right. So, Morgan, just before, literally, just before I came on this call with you guys, I'd gone out and done my final training session. Just a, a only a thirty minute um, light sprinting session. So, whenever you're working towards a game, you, your training kind of tapers off a little bit for the last two or three days before the game. Other than that, I'll spend a little bit more time tonight um, looking at the players that are most likely to be playing tomorrow. So, there's different ways of looking at your preparation. A lot of people focus on the actual team tactics, which is obviously important for me in terms of formations and styles of play, because that obviously has a massive impact on, on where I stand or run to. But more and more now, the it's important to get to know the personalities of the players that are involved in the game because they're the ones that you've got to try and deal with before they, before they start causing a problem in the game. So, you know, I've refereed City and Arsenal many times, so I know quite a few players. And now, thankfully, hopefully... A lot of the players know me and my, the way I approach things as well. So I'd like to think that potential problems are, are slightly limited based on everybody's knowledge of each other. But uh, the last the last 24, 48 hours will, will really focus on um, potential problems coming from players and then also just refreshing, refreshing our memory about the expectations. So the Premier League and our organisation, the PGMO, are very clear in, in what they expect to be given for 
as a penalty or what they expect as a red card or when they expect VAR to, to become involved. Um, and we've had, what is it, 100 days of, of no live football. So um, need to get back into the groove <laughs> to make sure that you're on up to speed with everything that people expect you to do. Great stuff. Yeah, I've got um, a couple of similar questions coming in from, because we know uh, the young people uh, on, on the uh, Zoom call have started their refereeing journey. And I think this is uh, linked to this a little bit. It's coming from India and from, from Mia. It's, it's how you deal with uh, discipline of, of players, uh, particularly when they you get a little bit more aggressive and, and in your face as such. Um, as, as a referee, how did you come to terms with that and how do you, how do you deal with that? Okay, so I think I mentioned it earlier, the, the most powerful tool in your armoury when you're trying to deal with somebody who's aggressive is, is your eye contact. Okay, so not a, certainly not, not saying that you should be staring them out because that will have the totally opposite effect, <laughs> particularly if someone's feeling aggressive towards you. Um, but eye contact's a really powerful way of getting your message across. Um, and and following that up with, with your body language as well. So it's no good being in somebody's face, um, waving your arms, pointing your fingers and all this kind of stuff, because all that's going to do is just wind that other person up more and more and more and more. Um, and so the best rule to try and follow is really to try and engage that person in how, how, how you'd like to be spoken to. And if, you, if you're remaining calm and you're speaking calmly and slowly to them that will actually have the effect of bringing them down a little bit um, and creating that little bit of distance of course you'll have to create a bit of distance anyway now through social distancing but even just creating that little bit of distance between us um, all contributes to calming people's emotions down rather than being in somebody's face um, pointing your finger which is only going to have one result and not not the result that you want again we've got a couple of double up questions here so from chris and adam and um obviously var is that topical conversation we have around football but um how has that changed uh your outlook of refereeing how has that impacted on you as a referee and the follow-up question to that as well was is the premier league better for var um, it hasn't really changed my outlook on refereeing because um, at the end of the day, VAR is there to help you get more decisions correct. But the bottom line that we always work to is that if you work hard to get the decision right in the first place, the less you will need to rely on VAR to, to bail you out. Um, I think the jury's still out for many people about whether VAR's had a positive impact. But again, that's a frustrating part of it because, you know, we, we, this season has shown this. 12 months ago, everybody was crying out for technology to come in. Okay. By Christmas, there was something like 12, 12 goals have been disallowed for offside, for example. Yeah. Correctly. Because somebody's big toe was close to the goal than, than it should have been. But unfortunately, under the law, that is offside. <laughs> um, and 12 months ago, before we had VAR, those things were getting flagged up and media pundits and managers were kicking off saying, well, we need VAR because that's offside and we need to help the official all of a sudden. And this was born out at a game that I did where, where we had a goal that was disallowed for offside correctly. And a player and a manager said to me, well, we don't want correct decisions anymore. We just don't need the AR. So, you know, it's it's had a positive effect in terms of more decisions are actually technically correct. But it's flipped people's mindsets a little bit. They don't like the disruption to the game. They don't like the waiting around. They've stopped short from saying, well, we actually want to go back to what we used to have and have things wrong and people complaining all the time. But you've got to be careful what you wish for. And in fact, I think some of the more recent suggestions as well, and this is what I mean by people in the media needing to make sure they know what they're saying. I heard one suggestion 
how to improve VAR yeah, was for, for the referees to go across to the screen, okay? Which is fine, but at the moment, we only use those in certain scenarios because the 20 clubs in the Premier League determine how we use that system. Well, the improvement was this media pundit had said, well, we don't need anybody at Stockley Park in London watching the video. We need the ref at the side of the pitch, but it's the guy in Stockley Park who sends the picture to the side of the pitch in the first place. So if you go and look, if you just want the ref going to the screen, then you'd be looking at a black screen because there's nobody there to <laughs> blank screen instead of uh, any pictures on there. So people need to be careful what they how they say things because they, they talk, there's a lot of factual inaccuracy still out there. Great stuff, thank you. Um, another one um, from Chris is, um, are you like the teams? Do you get a fixture list? Do you get a list of games that you know you're coming up or is it um, you referee one game and then you get told the next one? Do you, do you get that long fixture list? Do you know what you're doing over the next six weeks? I wish. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> So everything we do is performance based. So our appointments tend to come out at, on a Monday afternoon for the next seven days. So we only get a game week, week by week basis. Um, so even for these next nine games, we, in fact, we literally got an email at lunchtime to say what we're doing for next weekend. Um, so it's only a week by week basis because basically if, you, if you're not performing, you don't get appointments. Simple as. Um, and the same, it's the same principle for UEFA, so Champions League and, and Europa League. You basically, one game, if you perform well, you're in the hat for another game. If you don't perform well, you'll sit out two rounds of games. So it's very... People say we're not accountable. I can believe me, we are. <laughs> very much, yeah. We've got, um, uh, again, a couple of repeat questions coming in around. Your, your, your best game that you've refereed, your favourite game, I know you've mentioned the cup final, but also what's the toughest game? So is there is there particular games at the, the top ends where you think that's a really memorable game for you and one that maybe was a tough game for you? It's difficult to, uh, to, to say. In fact, it's unfair to say just the games at the top are difficult because if you actually think about it, your Man City, Liverpool's, City Arsenal, Tottenham Arsenal, even even though there's some great rivalry, um, the, the style of their play um, limits the amount of physical contact between players because they both counter-attack at such speed. There's not a lot of tackles going in. <laughs> it's play, plays breaking down and constantly flipping back and forth. You compare that to... Um, a team who let's go back a few years so like for example Stoke City when they were in the Premier League they were not renowned for playing free-flowing counter-attacking football they, they had very very definitive tactics which play to the strengths in their team so sometimes the more difficult games are when styles of that of Stoke come up against free-flowing teams and one of the one of the most difficult matches I've done. I did it three years, three consecutive seasons for Stoke, Stoke against Chelsea, um, and Stoke were their target was Diego Costa, and they just wanted to wind Diego Costa up. And you can imagine what his reactions are like, even even if he's not been fouled, he's been fouled, and you know. So it's it's the contrasting styles can make games really really difficult sometimes. I think the bigger games where you've got a lot of counter-attacking football and that's just me running box to box to box to box all the time with the odd decision to make, usually an important decision. That's more of a matter of mental focus and concentration. Whereas the contrasting styles of play, a long ball against free-flowing or breaking up the game, that requires 100% concentration, focus all the time because you're, you're probably giving about 43 kicks in that game. Whereas in... Arsenal City, you probably give about 15. Excellent, thank you. Another one that's come in here is an interesting one as well around um, maybe teams that you're not allowed to referee by yeah. um, where you might live um, yeah. or the team you might be a supporter of. Is there any restrictions around that? There are restrictions around that. So you basically at the start of the season, you have to declare what team you support, um, members of your family that hold season tickets, blah, blah all that kind of stuff. Um, so 
distance wise where I live in in Altrincham, which is comes comes under Cheshire FA, there's no Premier League team under Cheshire FA. Um, and although I'm quite close to City, United, Liverpool, um, there's no restriction on me refereeing those teams because I don't support either any of those teams. Excellent. Just checking through any more questions here. I know that Andy's got some that were sent in previously before before we all join yeah. the call. Yeah, if I just um, come in while, yeah. while Steve has a look at some other ones. So it, it, it kind of links to something that someone sent in before. Do you still get nervous at all prior to a game? Um, not really. A little bit. I, I suppose it's good in a way to have some kind of nerves. Um, but only nerves in a good way to, in terms of wanting to perform well. I certainly don't usually experience any nerves in terms of what's at stake on a game or anything like that because I firmly believe that if you've prepared properly and your mind's in the right place before you arrive at the ground, then then you, you'll just get the, the butterflies more from a, an emotional kick point of view rather than anything else. And then just... Um... Just another one, just touching on, obviously, at the minute we're all, well, coming out gradually from our COVID restrictions and so on. I know you've been doing, I know your dog's probably been walked a lot and yeah. I know you've been doing some volunteering yourself and yeah. along with your training. Can you just, just touch on that, how that's impacted? Yeah, so, I mean, the volunteering aspect was, was pure because, um, because of my sister being a doctor on the front line. And so I just, felt that anybody who was fit and healthy and had the time, then it's the least people could do for to, to help out. Um, so the stuff, some of the stuff I've been involved in is been delivering um, so that some families who were entitled to free school meals at the local colleges were delivering food parcels to them, food parcels to some of the old people. We actually had a, a shop in the town who we collected a, a load of old um, bedding duvet covers pillowcases and uh one of the antique shops in the town had started turning them into scrub bags for the hospital workers so it's nice to see that um a lot of people have kind of come together to help each other well then it's also you know it's it's shown really and everybody should really take care take heart from it that you know looking out for each other and staying positive can can work wonders in many many different ways so even moving forward out of lockdown for everybody on this call it's really important to to maintain that positive focus and that positive outlook because you can achieve so much when when you put your put your mind to it Andy this is this I've got another one here for Anthony coming from uh Morgan um a really good one there's obviously the games that are starting up now being played behind uh, closed doors yeah. Um, have you ever refereed a game at the top ends uh, behind closed doors before? Yeah. Um, so it was my last game before lockdown, actually. I did Paris PSG against Dortmund in the Champions League behind closed doors. So um, and I've done a couple of interna other international games in previous seasons. The, the one in Paris, would well, it'll, it'll be slightly different to the Premier League games because it was over 5,000 people still outside the stadium in Paris. So it wasn't particularly well placed outside. Um, but um, it presents different challenges to players and, and referees. So the whilst the atmosphere in the stadium won't be the same, the depending on what's at stake of the game, so if there's relegation or Champions League spot at stake, the game will just have the same pace and intensity I suspect as, as normal. It's if we get to the last couple of weeks of the season where there's not a lot to proceed to play for for the teams, then then we might see some some games maybe slowing up a little bit and not being as exciting to watch. And we were we were talking just before coming on to the to the call, um, all the different rules and regulations in place. So you know, mm. as a referee, um, you know, as as if you had to have a a good read up of all the different rules and regulations that are coming in in terms of uh, players' behaviour and and what playing behind closed doors means. Well, I mean, the, the in terms of the behaviour, the there's no specific stuff in terms of behaviour. So everybody's just been encouraged to to try and 
socially distanced where, where it's possible. So it'll be interesting to see how things happen because obviously a lot of team tactics a lot of the time is managers arguing with the fourth official or players trying to persuade referees getting into the, the rear. Now that's not going to be allowed to happen because the clearly been told do not go anywhere near people um and so it'd be interesting to see the, the shift in team tactics but but there's a lot of there's a lot of protocols in place i mean you know all of us have had to go through numerous amounts of, of testing um and there's a there's a very very small number of people are actually allowed in the stadium even smaller number of people are pitch side you know so Put it into context. I mean, some some clubs have support and backroom staff of 30, 40 people. Sometimes, and I think they're only allowed four people. So you know, it's even from the backroom side of things, no massages for players after games, all this kind of stuff. So big big changes. Got another one uh, coming here from from Matt. Is there uh, a lot of young people targeting a career within football? What advice would you give? On dealing with some of the negative comments towards your, your performance, don't read them. <laughs> Simple as. Um, I don't read any newspapers. Um, I don't watch the analysis on match of the day. Um, I don't have any social media at all. Um, just don't don't read them. And the the only reason someone's having a go at you because you're better than them in the first place. So. Okay, Andy, back to you. Have you got any more that were sent in previously? Yeah, I think I think we've probably covered covered all of them really. Um, I think if, if anyone's got any final questions, just pop them in the chat, and and St Steve and, and Luke can manage that. But I think just just from our perspective, and for all you guys on the call, really, there's some really good good life lessons that Anthony talked through, just about being the best that you can, whether it's refereeing, coaching, whether it's in your studies academically, it's just just being the best you can. So some really good good life lessons that you can you can probably take from that. Um, and so you get anything just to just to sum it up, really? Yeah, it's just um, really just to reiterate what I said to, before to all of you. There's um, you know being young can be difficult at times now, really really difficult, and you've all probably experienced circumstances in recent months that that not no other kids for years to come might experience um and so it's so so important that you take advantage of any of the help that's on offer to you if you need help ask somebody for help but more importantly always always um keep working towards being the really really the really the best you can be and always keep working towards your, your dreams and your goals Excellent. Andy, we've just got another one come in. So again, Anthony, if I can ask you this one, it's a really interesting one just to, to, to round things up. Um, yeah. what's, your, what's your plans when you stop refereeing? What's the plans for the future? <laughs> I know you're not there yet. We've got quite a few years to go, but what would be the plans in the future? Um, so again, a little, bit like, a little bit like players. So I, did, uh, I finished a master's degree last year um, in, in sport coaching. Um, and I... I do a bit of um, work in terms of development work for the FA through in, in the in the lower leagues with match officials. And I also like I, I do enjoy doing some talks to various companies at conferences in terms of um, leadership and and stuff like that. So may, maybe something along those lines. But you know, at the moment my immediate focus is for the next four years before I have to retire off the international list. So. Um, targets are the Euros and, and the next World Cup, but uh, again, that's a very sm real small chance to get selected for those, so it's really important we work really hard. And it's just one that's just come in here, a uh, couple actually around um, COVID and the current yeah. situation we're in, and obviously we're all out there when we're reading about all the testing that's going on um, for the players and the temperature test every day. Uh, has that been similar for yourself as officials? Yeah, so it's exactly the same. So the Premier League have employed a, a private company to do all the all the testing. So um, tested it's been roughly every five days at the moment, and then be tested on the morning of every every game that you do. And we've got to do temp temperature checks every day at home as well. 
submit those and medical questionnaires. So it's you know there's some real there's some real scrutiny and safeguards in place in terms of if if anybody's experienced anything. But it's a, it's a, it's a it's a blanket approach to anybody who's going to be involved on the field. Um, but it's a specific. But it's really important that people understand it's not. Um, it's not taking away capacity from healthcare workers who, who need that. It's a specific company that the Premier League are employed to do all this. So, Thank you. Um, Andy, I think that's got most of the questions off of the, uh, the chat box. So it's back to you again. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's us. I think that's us all, all wrapped up. So um, just to say uh, Anthony and Rebecca from the Premier League, just big thanks to, to you guys for giving up your time and, and answering all the questions, Anthony, and hopefully yeah. tomorrow night will go smoothly. I'm sure it will. Um, and just, just to say thanks and thanks to all you, you guys for, um, for joining us on the, the conversation.